the human potential to take a given technology and turn it into something that's really cool, that's really effective, that's helpful and beneficial to all of humanity is really quite amazing. I mean, we have such a capacity to, um, to take a tool and, and do some amazing things with it. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 63. This week, we embark on what I hope will be a successful periodic series where we hear from those who cover the drone space for a living and learn about some of the emerging trends and key storylines shaping the industry. It's my hope that we'll pick up a different perspective on the pulse of the industry and gain some new insights. On this first edition of Stories of the Drone, we have Jason Regan, a communications professional with 18 years of combined experience in communications, news, marketing, and information technology. Jason is a blogger and a self-proclaimed geek evangelist in the area of emerging tech and science. He currently works as a corporate communications director for a company in Boone, North Carolina, and he's a regular contributor to the online magazine Drone Life. He's here to talk about recent stories about drones and law enforcement, conservation, the drone deterrence industry, FAA enforcement, and the humanitarian use of drones. Let's pick up the interview where I asked Jason to tell us about himself. My name is Jason Reagan. I'm a communications specialist. I've worked as a journalist for 16 years, and I specialize in freelance tech writing now. And I also have a day job here in the beautiful mountains of North Carolina as a corporate communications director. What are some of the key responsibilities of a corporate communications director? Well, basically, I'm, ex- I'm responsible for the uh, external and internal communications for basically what amounts to a local private resort slash private community here in the mountains, which we have a lot of. I live in Boone, North Carolina. We're just down the road from Appalachian State. We have quite a few second homeowners and things like that. So my job is to ensure that our members are getting quality communication and then we're also communicating in an innovative way to the greater community outside. Now, you also write for Drone Life as well. Can you talk about how that association came to be? In 2014, to be honest, I knew very little about drones. I knew primarily what I would hear um, in the news. And, and of course, that was mostly dealing with military rather than commercial drones. I, you know, I knew they were out there. I had seen them in movies and things like that. Now, what I did know, however, is that I was really looking for a way to supplement my income because I had, at the time, two kids who were about to attend college, and now they are indeed attending college at the same time. So as someone who had worked in journalism for a while and as someone who had also worked as a freelance writer, I just began to search around uh, looking for some freelance gigs online, and I stumbled into drone life, and they were and still are a startup kind of news site in Boston or the Boston area. And they're um, dedicated to being the premier news source for anything having to do with the commercial drone industry. So they really don't deal with military applications and the issues that come out of that, but more the the growth and the issues that have emerged from the rise of the commercial drone uh, industry. So I began to write a few blog posts per week at that time, and as I've uh, increased my knowledge about drone technology, I've become more involved in writing with them and, and becoming more really of a, of a freelance partner with them and uh, sort of someone who can you know, talk about ideas with the editorial staff. And then on my own, I tweet about drones and other various tech sectors. Uh, it's something I'm very interested in. I'm one of these kind of people who I'm not really knowledgeable about the technical details of emerging tech, but I love what they do. I love to see the uh, the outcome and the effect and that sort of thing. In 2014, how difficult was it to find stories about the drone industry? Obviously, it was a little more difficult than it is now because 
Uh, and I feel like I've entered this uh, arena at a particularly good time. Uh, it feels sort of like what was going on in the late 1990s into the 2000s with the uh, the internet and web startups and things like that. At the time, there was a substantial amount of news about commercial drones. It was really starting to become, quote unquote, a thing, you know. That's when stories about drone delivery started to rear its head. That's when uh, you started to see... A lot of entrepreneurs start videography businesses, and that's and that's really what it's primarily been all along. Videography is really the driving force, I think, behind most drone technology, although that is changing as the technology um, gets a little more sophisticated. How often do you write stories? I was submitting a few posts a week, and now I probably produce about five to seven per week. So uh, I've definitely increased my involvement and it's been really a joy to be sort of on the cutting edge of, of a new technology and just watching what's happening. It's uh, I feel like in some respects, I'm still a spectator in the industry, but boy, it really is a front row seat. Can you give us a glimpse of what it's like from that seat? What stories were you involved in? So when I first started, like I said, I was a newbie and I was sort of getting... Story assignments that covered a lot of different things. I mean, there was, you know, I never really knew what what would be going on in a particular week. And of course, I was encouraged to find my own. I think at the time, though, and it was certainly understandable that the editorial staff sort of spoon fed me the ideas like, here's a thing that we're looking at, go cover it. And then as uh, things progressed and evolved, I began to be able to, and I'm still able to sort of set my own tone and choose what articles I cover uh, without any real oversight. And so at the time, like I said, I was just doing a lot of different things. I was very much a generalist. I started getting into the startup market because that was what it, what was exciting to me is covering these small firms that were starting to gradually grow and gain startup capital and get funded. And so that was exciting. And also to see how drones were used in so, so many varieties of uh, industries, agriculture, uh, infrastructure, inspection, real estate. I mean, you name it. Is there a topic that you're focusing on or that seems to be rising to the top these days? Primarily what I'm doing now is I'm covering uh, how public safety agencies are, are using drones in the area of security, police, fire departments, things like that. And what's really been interesting is how this is really a worldwide phenomenon. It's not something that's primarily just happening in the U.S. You're seeing it in a lot of other countries. Great Britain, been in the news a lot, and you're seeing them use drones more in police work and border patrol and things like that, especially stemming off, you know, the vote to leave the European Union that has some implications in terms of border control. And we're seeing a lot of drones used in India to police large scale gatherings. You know, one of the things that you see a lot in India is they have a lot of festivals which draw thousands upon thousands of people. And the government is, is particularly interested in using drones for crowd control and to watch out for security concerns, things like that. We're seeing it really in just about any country you could think of. They're all really looking to uh, enhance their police capabilities and get a handle on emergencies and large fires and chemical spills and anything you can possibly imagine. So it's very exciting. Tell us about some of the stories that you've covered that really sparked your interest. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, for me, the real joy I get is seeing how drones are used to literally save lives. Uh, one of the stories I recently covered um, was about a teacher, um, I believe it was Ohio or Indiana, Midwestern state, and she was missing possibly as from a medical condition. And the police, you know, they looked and used the standard methods. And then uh, one of the neighbors in, in the area said, look, I've got a drone and let's put it up and I'll be happy to help you find her. And boom, almost immediately after launching the drone, they were able to locate her. And that's not that uncommon with police agencies that use drones. That's one of the the best uses because in the past, when you have a small, maybe a rural town or, or small city type of police agency, you know, if they want to do a search or if they want to get a handle on a situation, they would often have to requisition a helicopter from maybe the state police or some other agency. And so they're losing a lot of time. They're losing daylight if it's a, if it's a rescue operation. And with a police drone, they can uh, simply take one of their trained officers put them in the field, put the drone in the sky, and before you know it, they really have a good handle on, you know, any kind of emergency situation. Are you seeing more stories about drones being used for search and rescue? 
I'm seeing it on an increasing scale, absolutely. And um, if you go to Drone Life and you search for something like rescue or search and rescue or something like that, you'll see how how it really is being used to find missing persons and, and to rescue people who are maybe in a precarious situation. You know, for example, a hiker who may have fallen. I mean, you look at an example, um, you know, a few years ago. And I'm going to really garble this, but there was the movie that starred James Franco about the hiker who got stuck, I think, in New Mexico or Utah. You remember that? Uh, you fast forward to today, obviously, people didn't know he was missing for a while. But as I understand it, the rescue workers had to really travel a great distance to find where he was, uh, you know, from the main road. So you have a drone in that situation. You could definitely uh, cut down on the rescue time. So that is something that's increasing. A lot of agencies are asking for permission from their various governments. I know the uh, government agency in Vancouver that does search and rescue is asking the Transport Canada, which is the equivalent to their FAA, for permission to, to use drones in maritime rescues, search and rescues in bodies of water. And things like that. So it's definitely something that you're going to continue to see. You're going to continue to see drones literally save people's lives. Do local governments have the authority to use drones if they want to, or do they need to get FAA approval first? Well, I mean, it's interesting that uh, definitely in the past with FAA exemption application rules, each police department or public safety agency would definitely have to get permission from the FAA or if it's in Canada, Transport Canada, or, um, you know, Brit Britain has their own version. I mean, every nation has their own version of the FAA, FAA and they have varying degrees of uh, regulation. So obviously, that's something they're all going to have to do. And I haven't actually ran into any situation where you have a public safety agency that just jumps in and, and then has to back up because the FAA, you know, maybe kind of slaps their hand and says no, no. So it's been a pretty orderly process. And of course, there are companies now out there that are starting to market to public safety agencies. There's one in Michigan, and I apologize, I can't remember the name, but they're really working with a lot of Michigan law enforcement agencies to basically walk them through the steps. In other words, they have legal resources that can help them sort of jump through the right hoops in order to get uh, up in the air and get their officers trained and that sort of thing. And you're seeing a lot of that. You're seeing an ancillary group of industries pop up. You've got a lot of different consulting groups rather than just companies that sell drones. Now you're having you're seeing companies that actually offer services to train people and you know make sure they're deploying their drones in a legal, safe, and effective manner. What other stories strike you in terms of where the industry is going? Well, for one thing, I think you're starting to see more entrepreneurs enter the game. You know, you really just have to have a drone and make sure you're following FAA rules to, um, to get into the game. You know, I live in a, in a relatively small town in, in this western North Carolina county where I live. We have a population of about 40,000 people and about 12,000, I would suppose, would be college students. So it's, a, it's not a huge area. And I can name two or three small business owners who have dropped into the drone industry. There's a guy named Jordan Nelson. I think he's at nelsonaerials.com. Jordan's a younger man. He actually gained some 15 minutes of fame recently. He was featured on uh, the Today Show because he and his fiance or his girlfriend at the time hiked to the top of Grandfather Mountain, which is just an amazing, breathtaking mountainous area here. Beautiful place to hike, beautiful views. He gets up to the top of this huge boulder type rock formation and he sets his drone on autonomous. His girlfriend doesn't know what's going on, and he proposes to her while the drone films in it. That got some viral mileage. It got featured on, I think, Good Morning America and The Today Show. So my point being, you know, even in a small area like this, we're seeing three to five different small firms that are uh, getting into the drone business, especially with videography and things like that. So I think that's one trend. Another area that I'm seeing real growth in would be what's called the anti-drone industry or the drone detection industry. And it's sort of a, you know, every action has an equal but opposite reaction. And that's sort of the case with the anti-drone industry. So the idea behind that is to create and deploy certain kinds of technologies that will actually either knock a drone out of the air if it's in an unauthorized area, take control of it basically, or jam its signal. Because as you know, you know, drones are controlled by, in general, radio signals or in some cases, Wi-Fi. So that's the object of a anti-drone uh, solution is to make sure a drone is not where it's supposed to be or is not in the area that it's supposed to be in. Most drone operators, most drone owners and users and pilots, they're responsible. 
They understand the rules. They're not interested in causing anyone any harm. And like any situation, you have the few rotten apples. And that's what you're seeing uh, with a lot of the headlines. You're seeing headlines where supposedly uh, you'll have a drone that almost hits a jet. Uh, you'll have a drone being you know, near an airport where it's not supposed to be. Or, And in some cases, those are valid actual happenings. But, but we've also saw, to be fair to drones in general or the drone industry in general, a lot of times it turns out not to be the case. Uh, and we cover that somewhat in drone life. While there are valid complaints and valid incidents, there are also a lot of incidents where people end up crying wolf. They think they saw a drone, but they really didn't. So the anti-drone industry is, is a natural outcropping of the growth of drones. And you're talking about a lot of different solutions that these companies are offering. For example, there's a company called Battelle. They've created somewhat of an anti-drone rifle. And that that's not what it sounds like. It's not shooting drones out of the air. But the rifle kind of resembles, I guess, the cross between a standard rifle and kind of a grenade launcher or something like that. It can be shoulder mount mounted and you can point it towards a drone and it'll release you know, signals that'll basically kill the drone. There are other solutions where you can have almost like a hacking sort of situation where you have a product that can actually take over a drone and land it safely. There are also solutions that can help identify a drone so that it can be reported to the FAA. You know, it is a valid concern. It is a valid concern to make sure an errant drone is uh, is away from an area where it's not supposed to be and make sure they're not in an unauthorized place. So, so that certainly does have its place. So we're seeing that as sort of a response to some of the more miscreant type of drone users who are kind of making it, spoiling it for everyone else. From the research you've compiled, how effective have these anti-drone solutions been so far? You know, I think it might be too early to tell because, I, you know, I'll be honest, what I tend to be covering are companies that are just coming out with products. It's an early adopter kind of phase. It's uh, a lot of them, they're in prototype, but they do seem to work when they're tested. Um, I just wrote an article called, you know, five anti-drone solutions that are uh, sort of at the top of the market right now. And I think it's too soon to tell whether or not they're going to be overall effective. I'm sure it'll be like any growing industry. You'll have some companies that will crash and burn. You'll have some that'll emerge as the, you know, the Googles and Amazons of, of the anti-drone industry that'll really offer quality products. It's really going to be difficult to say, I think, until, you know, we've had this sort of time to test the waters and see how, how things work. But I think it does look good. I think that it's a natural evolution for both drones and anti-drone products you're going to see more and more innovative products. They're going to get more sophisticated. And it's going to be a Darwinian process where you have the good, the bad, and the ugly, so to speak. And uh, the good will rise to the top. Do you know if anyone's working on a force field type deterrent that will either zap a drone out of the sky or prevent it from entering the airspace? There are some products like that that create sort of a fence. In fact, there's an Israeli tech firm that they're looking to create sort of a virtual dome and of course their products called a uh, drone dome and it's basically built as sort of this end-to-end -end defense solution that's supposed to be able to detect identify track and neutralize drones and it's essentially kind of a radar slash radio jamming system that's supposed to be able to provide sort of a fence kind of a virtual force field i guess you could call it up to three kilometers out and it can jam the signals of a drone i mean it just has a lot of different neat technology under the hood Another anti-drone solution that's making, uh, I think, a lot of headlines is called Drone Shield. They actually had a real-world test during the uh, 2015 and 2016 Boston Marathon. Obviously, for security purposes, officials had declared the marathon route as a no-drone zone. And so what Drone Shield was actually able to do is they use acoustic technology, and they're not particularly an anti-drone company as much as they are a drone detection company. But of course, once you detect the drones, you could, you know, you could then deploy, you know, whatever kind of anti-drone tech you may have. So what Drone Shield actually does is they can detect incoming drones from up to about 150 yards and then send out an email or a text message to whomever needs to know, say it's a police agency or federal officials or whoever is, is uh, in charge of maintaining a no drone zone. They can actually do that. And this company's actually grown quite a bit. In fact, they started as a little firm in uh, Herndon, Virginia, and they recently were acquired by an Australian 
VC groups. So they're actually going uh, public on the Australian Stock Exchange. Some of their clients include prisons who've started using the product to stop drones from delivering contraband, like cell phones or drugs, to prisoners. And actually, that's something that, uh, uh, believe it or not, is not a particularly uncommon occurrence more and more. We're actually seeing uh, someone on the outside trying to smuggle things into prisons by sending a drone over the wall and dropping it. Did you cover the story about the drone with the gun and the flamethrower? That's an intri- Yeah, that I did. And that's been a very interesting drama. So last year, you had a uh, mechanical engineering student at Central Connecticut State release a video that basically showed a drone carrying a gun as well as a flamethrower and actually making the flamethrower work. And of course, that caused some excitement. It caused some concern because uh, everyone was thinking, oh my God, we we may have weaponized drones now uh, in a domestic situation. So basically what happened is the uh, Connecticut police investigated and really they found that at the time, the student wasn't really violating any particular uh, state laws. So the FAA got involved later and they launched an investigation and they basically wanted the gentleman to submit documents pertaining to the uh, supposedly weaponized drones. And, and of course, I think there's some some bit of debate as to how real things really were. And, you know, no one's really been able to examine the drones themselves independently. So uh, right now, the uh, case is in the federal court system and the FAA is contending that the uh, father and son basically built or operated the drones carrying weapons. And they're contending that obviously there's a capability of causing serious injury to someone or their property or, or something like that. So it's a very interesting case. And I think that, not to, not to be an alarmist, I think that, uh, like with any technology, there's going to be misuse. And I think that most people would agree that it's not if or when that a drone could, could actually be used in some kind of you know, explosive situation or, or someone actually weaponizing a drone in a way that causes real harm to people. It's, I think it is going to happen. And I think that's why the industry has to work with the FAA to come up with solutions that uh, aren't heavy-handed. You know, they aren't just going to stop the innovation in the commercial drone field, but also uh, protect the public safety. And I, and, and I think everybody wants to see that. Everybody who's responsible in involved in the industry wants to have a situation where uh, safety is of paramount importance, but also that the drone industry doesn't get uh, strangled out of existence by overregulation. Especially as Part 107 goes into effect and a number of drone operators multiply. Right. And we're already seeing that. In fact, in my job as a communications director, I um, recently hired a local still photographer, an on the ground photographer to uh, take some marketing photos. And he was doing this work as the FAA uh, regulations were being released and the 107. And (laughs) the next day or the next week, rather, he was really excited. He called me up and said, I'm so excited. I'm going to be able to get into the drone business now. And so it's really opening the doors up for you know, a lot of different types of professionals and a lot of different people in the technology field to really, no pun intended, spread their wings and fly in in terms of uh, what they're able to do with drone tech. So it's very exciting. Okay, give us another topic that you feel is noteworthy. I think one of the most interesting ways drones are being used that's not getting a lot of press, although I'm trying to bring, bring it to light with the things I write, is how drones are being used for things like conservation, for anti-poaching efforts in terms of you know sustaining wildlife and sustaining the environment. There's a lot of great ways that drones can be used in that sense. Uh, one of the most interesting stories, you know, along those lines, is probably something called the uh, Snotbot. I know that doesn't sound like a name you'd want to bring to some potential investors, but Snotbot is actually a research project that was a partnership between the Olin College of Engineering in uh, Massachusetts and the uh, Ocean Alliance, which is a nonprofit that's obviously interested in preserving oceanic wildlife. So here's the problem. If you're a researcher for for a certain kind of uh, whale, it's very difficult to gather any meaningful data about the health of a pod of whales because actually gathering biological matter 
for lack of a better term, excretions that whales may have that can allow researchers to gather data and samples to determine whether the whales are in a stressful situation. If something that humans are doing are, are causing stress to, you know, these amazing aquatic mammals, it's very hard to get data. So, in fact, one of the problems is that in gathering the data and trying to actually gather mucus from the spray of the whales as they expel it, you know, from the blowhole and that sort of thing, actually getting in close and trying to collect that can cause the whales stress. So it's a catch-22. You're not able to know, well, you know, are the whales really stressed because we went in and collected the, the uh, samples or were they stressed because of something else? So that's where the snot bot comes into being. So basically the snot bot concept is to send a small drone that doesn't make a lot of noise, that's not intrusive, that's uh, a much greater advantage over a helicopter or an airplane, which can be expensive and dangerous, to go in and basically gather up the, uh, let's just say it, snot, and bring it back to the researchers. And that allows them to uh, obviously get better data and they can uh, predict the behaviors of the whales, find out if there's any problems. It's kind of like trying to give a, a medical physical to a whale without actually the whale knowing what's going on. How does it do that? I somehow have this vision in my mind of a drone carrying a large Kleenex, trying to get a drone to blow its nose. Well, I mean, it's, uh, I guess in a sense, it kind of works that way. I mean, what they can do is they can actually add a payload to a drone. And specifically, right now, DJI, as you know, they're the, really the world's biggest manufacturer of drones. They've actually teamed up with uh, the Ocean Alliance to provide uh, Phantom drones. And so, as you know, these aren't huge quadcopters. They're, you know, they're fairly compact. And what they can actually do is add some payload to the drone and the drone can sort of fly into the spray. When the whale surfaces, it, it emits the spray. They can fly in and around it. The um, probes that they have on the drone can gather up whatever they need. And I assume it's not a lot. I mean, I think you can just, uh, a little snot goes a long way, I guess, when you're dealing with uh, whale studies. And so that's kind of how it works. I, I don't know the technicalities beyond that, but I do know that you know you can look up Snotbot um, on Drone Life, and you can actually see videos of how it works. You know, it's really quite uh, interesting because what that will allow them to do it it allows them to get samples of of the linings of the lungs of the whales. They can analyze DNA. They can detect viruses. They can detect bacteria find toxins, measure hormone levels. I mean, they can basically any, do anything that a doctor could do for you and I when we go you know, to a physical and get some blood work. So it's, uh, it's, really, it's really a neat thing. In fact, it's such a unique concept that Patrick Stewart actually filmed a video, kind of narrated a video and uh, to basically raise awareness about this issue and about this technology. So if you know that if Captain Picard is uh, behind your efforts, you're probably doing things right. I think you make a good point about the conservation value of drones. I interviewed Mike Kirstein of Over African Skies recently as he talked about how drones were being used to help deter poachers in the wildlife parks. I also interviewed Kurt Klausmeyer of the Nature's Conservancy in California on a climate change project. Just two examples of how drones can play a really innovative role in supporting conservation. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, not to mention tracking wildlife. If you're trying to track a, um, you know, a certain species and, and how are they doing it and where are they going, you can use thermal in imaging, you can use, you know, down facing radars, uh, things like that. And so it really has been a great shot in the arm for um, wildlife researchers and, and ecologists. So, you know, I think it's going to be just like the effect we saw with the internet. Obviously, there were some rough patches when the internet first became a new technology, but, you know, now we can't live without it. You and I are having this conversation. I mean, I'm using a Wi-Fi connection to conduct this interview. And so I think you're going to see the same thing with drones. I think there's going to be some fear. There's going to be a fear factor with the public. There's going to be this um, kind of trepidation. You know, is it going to invade my privacy? Do the uh, benefits outweigh the uh, cost? And I think overall, we're going to find that, yes, the benefits definitely do outweigh the cost. Um, you know, you're going to see just so many different applications, things that haven't, haven't even been created yet. So it's, it's a really exciting time to be uh, covering the drone industry. Another area that we talked about previously was the use of drones to deliver medical supplies. You've done some stories on that as well, right? That is right, and, that's an, and that is another way that you can uh, use drones for humanitarian efforts. I mean, you can envision having to get supplies following an earthquake, for example. Uh, and I know that in Nepal, 
when they had the earthquakes um, not too uh, long ago, that drones were used. I know some agencies in India actually loaned out some drones, and they were not they were not using them for payloads. They were using them to basically get a bird's eye view of what was going on and assess damage and find uh, you know any possible victims who may be stuck. But delivery is not far around the corner. Of course, the you know, the challenges you face with drone delivery is you have to have a powerful enough drone to be able to carry, you know, whatever payload you need. And and as you know, watching quadcopters, you know, the kind that are consumer level, at least, you're, you're not going to be able to carry a whole lot with them. Uh, you know, maybe a half a kilogram or something like that or less, definitely, or maybe even just a kilogram. So that's definitely a challenge. You're going to have to have larger drones. You're going to have to have drones that are able to be fueled by something other than LiPo batteries. So, you know, there's there are certain innovations right now. I know um, Drone Life's covered a few stories where people are looking at hydrogen cells to power drones. And so, you know, we're going to have to have some breakthroughs, I think, in overall power cells for drones before we can really get to some really serious type of uh, drone delivery. But we are seeing it. And we know Amazon's demonstrated it, that it can be done. We do know that medical supplies can and are being uh, distributed in some cases across the world. And one of the stories that I uh, saw out of India and I actually covered and wrote about, they're actually looking at a pilot program to deliver organs, you know, and organ transplants to go from point A, wherever the organs located to the organ bank to a particular hospital. And as you know, when you have really large cities like Mumbai and places like that, you can also often have gridlock and, uh, you know, traffic issues and that sort of thing, where minutes really mean uh, the difference between success and failure of, of any kind of organ transplant. You know, it makes a lot more sense if you could actually put the organ into some kind of uh, carrier or something like that, attach it to the drone. And, um, you know, I think you could even get to the point where it would even be autonomous. You, know, you could program by GPS where the hospital is, where it needs to land, and uh, much like an Amazon drone delivery product, it would just be done maybe in a matter of minutes, depending on where the uh, you know where point A is from point B. So that's very exciting. I mean, that again, another example of where drones can save lives. And that's really kind of an extension of what happens today, anyways, uh, with a helicopter that's used to transport an organ to a hospital or across town or to another city. Except in the future, drones may be doing it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're talking about a reduction in cost. We're talking about a reduction in, you know, the risk of human life being lost in a potential crash or something like that. And, and of course, there's an availability issue. There are only so many rescue helicopters available. I know where, again, where I live in the mountains, you know, we're largely dependent on medical helicopters from Charlotte, North Carolina or Greensboro or somewhere like that. And, you know, you're talking about a uh, hundred or so miles away. This kind of circles back around to public safety drones. I think you'll probably see a day where drones are as ubiquitous in small towns and, and among small town police departments and fire departments. You know, it'll just be an essential part of, of their equipment. They won't even think about, you know, oh, there was a time when we didn't have drones. It'll just be, oh, well, this is something that, you know, we've had for quite a while and we use them every day. In covering the drone industry over the past two years, what have been some of the lessons that you've learned or picked up from this whole experience? I think I've learned that the human potential to take a given technology and turn it into something that's really cool, that's really effective, that's helpful and beneficial to all of humanity is really quite amazing. I mean, we have such a capacity to, um, to take a tool and, and do some amazing things with it. Not to get too philosophical, I mean, that's sort of what we are as a species. We're the animal that can use a tool. And, you know, you go back to fire up until the automobile, to the computer, to the drone. And that's just what we've always done as humans. We've always been able to take an idea and turn, make it a reality and take that reality and actually make the world a better place. There is the inevitable other side of that coin where you have people who can look at a drone and say, hey, I bet I could use that to smuggle drugs into a prison yard. I think I'm going to do that. Or, hey, I'm going to uh, go fly over a wildfire and, and get in the way of, of actual firefighting helicopters. Or I'm going to fly it near, I'm going to see how close I can fly to an airliner. You are going to get people like that. I mean, it's, you look back, there are so many parallels between the drone rush, so to speak, and the rise of the internet. 
you know, there were so many great and cool things that we were able to do, even, you know, from the late 90s uh, to the 2000s. Think about all the great things that arose from that. But then at the same time, obviously, there were problems with online predators and identity theft. And we still have those issues, viruses, you name it. You know, it's just the reality of any new technology. There's going to be good, there's going to be bad. And basically, it's up to us as uh, the human race to decide, okay, is this technology so great that we're willing to mitigate the risks and the problems to allow this technology to move forward? And I think the answer is a resounding yes. Getting back to what else did I learn? I learned that it doesn't take people long to get over their initial fear factor when it comes to new technology. And again, you look back to the internet, a lot of people were afraid. They didn't exactly know how it would work. They didn't know how their private information would be handled. They didn't know a lot of things. But over time, we all became quite sophisticated. I mean, we have people who are in their 90s now who, uh, you know, they're just as proficient at uh, surfing the web as anyone else uh, might be. And so it's become that way with the Internet. It's going to become the same way with drones. It's kind of, and, and, you know, I'll admit this, even being someone who's enthusiastic about drones, when you're standing next to one and it launches and it's hovering over you, there is kind of this feeling. It's There's a feeling of a little you know, it's, it makes you a little nervous. It's not something we're used to. It's, uh, it's different. But I think that uh, as people see the benefits, as they see drones saving lives, uh, finding uh, missing persons, uh, saving uh, whole species, perhaps of, of various animals, I think overall people are going to say, yeah, this is a good thing. We're going to get behind it. And of course, there's the fun factor as well. I haven't been fortunate enough to fly a lot of different drones so far. I've, I've flown a couple of minis, but boy, it's so much fun and it's so addictive to be able to put one of those things in the air and be able to control it and, and watch it go. And it gives people a new lens on, on how they view the world because it's one thing to you know see things the way we do normally from the ground. It's quite another to say, oh, wow, I didn't know my neighborhood looked like that from the air. Or, you know, I didn't know this is how things could be from from uh, the sky and so it's uh, and you know it's something we've always wanted to do as humans is we've always wanted to fly and we you know we finally and i'm proud to say that i live in the state that was first in flight north carolina with the wright brothers and ever since then we've all wanted to kind of be a part of that and with a drone and especially as drones begin to be integrated with virtual reality goggles and things like that it's going to make flight you know, almost a normal thing at least in a virtual sense so I think that's what I've learned is the fear factors there. And I've learned that, again, going back to the anti-drone situation, again, for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. And that's uh, anytime you have a new industry, you're going to see other industries pop up. And that's a good thing from an economic standpoint. That means that, you know, maybe I'm an attorney and I can become a specialist in drone law. You know, that's expanded my practice. It's made me someone unique. Or maybe I'm someone who's, you know, really good at using things like the Raspberry Pi type computers to come up with an anti-drone solution, which that's happening now, too. You're getting um, white hat hackers who are able to come up with uh, drone jamming solutions. And they're not out there jamming drones and doing bad things. What they're doing is saying to manufacturers, hey, look, we were able to take a few spare parts and knock your drone out of the air. You might want to do something about that. And in fact, there was a group out of Johns Hopkins uh, recently about a, a group of researchers, cyber researchers or cybersecurity researchers, rather, uh, were able to take a couple of, you know, off the shelf kind of parts and Wi-Fi processors and things like that and take a uh, Bebop drone made by Parrot. They were able to knock it right out of the sky. And so they didn't go out and do evil things with that. They sent the information to Parrot and said, look, here's a thing. Here's a problem. You might, might want to fix that. You know, you might want to uh, address that security vulnerability. And that's good. You know, that's good that, that you've got sort of the yin and yang, so to speak, of drones with the drone sector and the anti-drone sector, because they can each work to make the situation more stable and make everything work more in harmony. So that we do have responsible drone users out there and we have drone companies that are making drones that aren't susceptible to security problems. And then on the other side, we have places where drones shouldn't be protected in a sustainable way so that if, you know, if you're having a major marathon or something where security is an issue, you can take measures. Like with the Euro Cup soccer events that just went on in France, 
you know, they actually did use drones to patrol, but they also used some anti-drone tech. And so you're, you're going to see that as just a, a regular way of doing business. Where does your motivation to cover and to write about this industry come from? You know, I, I consider myself sort of an evangelist for not only the drone industry, but for the tech industry, for all the really cool things that are being made out there. I, I told one of my friends who's involved in a startup incubator, I said, you know, I can't code. I'm terrible at math. I was okay in science. I've always been a wordsmithing kind of guy. You know, I've always been about writing and editing. So I can't create the next great product. But you know what? I can actually be your cheerleader. I can do everything I can to make sure that the message is out there, that technology is really cool, it's accessible, it's changing the world for the better, and that goes for the drone industry as well. So I just hope that everyone will spread that good news that drones are really cool, they're fun to operate in a legal, responsible way, and you can make your fortune as a startup, you can use it to make the world a better place, you can you know, fight poachers, you can help find missing persons. You can do so many great things. As long as you do it in a way that's going to make the FAA happy, it's really a, an amazing technology. I'm just really grateful to be here to, like I said, sit on the sidelines and write about what I see. That's it for episode 63 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed listening to Jason Regan and hearing about his perspectives on the drone industry. I want to thank Jason for sharing his insights. If you want to connect with Jason, use his Twitter handle of at Jason P. Regan. You can also read his articles on Drone Life at DroneLife.com. If you're a journalist or a blogger covering the drone industry and would like to be part of a future Stories of the Drone segment, send me an email. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a positive review on iTunes. It really does help. And as always, I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Gores. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.